Oh, yes, it is Death Metal Chronicles show of the Ukraine shows on Mon Monday the 3rd. We have highlights of speaking of places like Canada and Muslim terrorists. Obama's not ruling out U.S. military action in Congress. Unsung Heroes of War, and so much more. I'm Wolf. I'm Joes. Hey, Jose, how's your day going? Busy. You been busy? Yeah. What you been doing, bro? Calling in noobs? I don't even know anymore, dude. <laughs> you don't even know it. What? <laughs> What kind of a uh, business does your mom own? She's like a mercenary or something? Yeah, she's a mercenary <laughs> in uh, Fairfax. Che Guevara's uh, right-hand woman? Yeah. <laughs> actually, that's work. a good question. Did your mom actually fight for the uh, the Guevara uh, crusade, I guess, during uh, the, the 60s? Yeah, man. She's a... Uh, she's fucking... A revolutionary? She's a spook from Argentina. <laughs> Who helped to destabilize Bolivia? And <laughs> yeah. Now, now she's hiding out here in the <laughs> U.S. of A. Cause she couldn't take Chen Guevara's shit. <laughs> so funny. But it's you know, like the most true stuff is always the craziest shit that like you know that people can come up with. SpecialOperationSpeaks.com Intel chair set to recall former CIA heads Morell and Petraeus over Benghazi cover-up. Republican allegations that former CIA acting director Michael Morell misled Congress over White House's role in crafting the flawed Benghazi talking points. Took a dramatic turn Thursday with the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee telling Fox News it's likely Morell will be recalled to testify. Investigators are reviewing the testimony of former CIA director David Petraeus, Morell's old boss, to assess... Asses? 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 Asses. 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 Whether he should be recalled as well. We were having some transcript reviews. We've been continuing... That was... What the fuck, give? Uh, what was his name? Not William Shatner. Louis, Louis Picard? Louis C.K.? Uh, no, no, no. Picard. What's his real name? I, I don't know Picard. <laughs> Jean, Jean-Luc Picard, yes. Oh. Who betrayed by Patrick Stewart. And then, as soon as you just press images... Mm. <laughs> Face palming, what the fucks give. <laughs> where's the where's the meme photo? What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> oh god! <laughs> We're looking at the director portrays his transcripts and reviews, looking at what information we have now available. Sometimes that second interview could be equally as important, as likely as we'll have Director Morell appear to testify before the committee. The debate continues to focus on why the talking points did not reflect the best available intelligence, and what influence the administration brought to bear on the flawed public narrative on the attack in the days immediately following September 11, 2012. That narrative initially claimed the attack sprung out of protests over anti-Islam Film. Mm. Any comments? No comments. Rangers lead the way! We speak out, Rangers! Well, speaking of that, Unsung Heroes of War! Ranger speaks! Uh. Wanna read that, Jose? Ranger speaks. Thus far, Ukrainian. Ukrainians are disorganized and divided. Is that just crime? Crime has been annexed. 
pretty much now in the shot fire that I have heard of. If they value their liberty and their sovereignty, they need to fight for it. We ain't gonna do for him, at least not over, over it, overtly. So that's actually a pretty amazing statement for my buddy Ranger Speaks. His comment, if you read into it, we ain't gonna do anything for them overtly. Overtly. So who's that American guy who used to work for Booz Allen Hamilton, who wasn't a special ops guy, but eventually became a CIA guy and then into Booz Allen Hamilton, who's presently in Russia? Edward... Bloden. Edward Bloden. Edward Snowden. Snowden. So, what could you use with an ex- member of America who used to fight for freedom and democracy who possibly could be in Russia. What could you do with that guy? You could give him money. You could give him money. Lots of money. Why wouldn't you shit? I mean, that's my conspiracy theory with that. Why fucking not? He's an ex-dude who used to work for people who did stuff with the guys who do the things... You know, you give him fucking money, he bribes Putin to not invade, Putin. and then, you know. So this is interesting, I found this on SoftRep. The Canadian government has joined their main ally, the United States of America, Canada's body, <laughs> to America's hat. The other allies, and a strong message against Russian intervention in Ukraine... Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russian citizens and military personnel were at risk in Crimea, most notably around the Sibalispol, home of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, but ignored U.S. President Barack Obama's warning on Friday about military intervention. Let's look at... Russia's Black Sea Fleet. How did that not come up? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Black Sea. Bam. Here we go. So, you've got Bulgaria. Now, Savaspol. So, if you're looking on the maps, you've got... Okay, so don't look at it as in Russia or in Europe. Look at it as Turkey, Syria, Tehran, Iraq. So, where has America been? Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Georgia, <laughs> Azerbaijan, okay? So, if you're looking at it there, and then you've got the Black Sea Fleet, why would Russia's people be based there? Because America's fucking surrounding them. I mean, like, come on. You know, you've got America in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Pakistan, fucking the NATO base down here, Yemen, <laughs> like this whole area. So, Russia's going to be protecting their shit, right? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that America has fucking fleet probably all along the fucking Turkey and even in Georgia, you know, entire naval fleets. I mean, you could probably just fucking look it up on the webs and see it. So, you know, you've got the Russian fleet there headed, well, headed towards Ukraine I mean, it's not like they're not there. And if they've got, you know, fucking the ability to reach, you know, Kiev or other places with those platforms, they're going to be able to take shit out. You know, or supplied food, water, and humanitarian rations to help the, the people of Ukraine in their wicked ways, I guess. Want to read the rest of this? Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper has called a special ca cabinet 
meeting after Russia's parliament approved a military intervention in Ukraine earlier this week. He also pledged Canada's very strong support for Ukraine's integrity. Mr. Hopper spoke with Barack Obama earlier today, 1 March 14, over the phone and agreed on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine should be respected. Oh. He should. He has also spoken earlier this week with his British counterpart, Prime Minister David Cameron, and Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel, who is one of the main links between the Western Western leaders and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Canadian Foreign Affairs Minister John Bayard is currently in Kiev, firmly supporting the interim government. He said Canada would offer economic, political, and technical support. He also stated Canada will not will work or yeah will work with the International Monetary Fund, and will provide observers for Ukraine's spring election. Mr. Mr. Bayard Beard. Bayard told the press after a meeting with newly appointed interim president and prime minister of Ukraine, we stand on the side of Ukraine people. He also added, we stand for peace, prosperity, security, and freedom. We expect the Russian Federation to honor the commitments it made in Budapest's declaration, committing the Ukraine's territorial sovereignty, and we can well, we certainly don't apologize for standing with Ukrainian people in their struggle for freedom. Nothing was said about Canadian forces readiness to offer a military intervention in a last resort effort. Canada has 1.3 million Ukrainian Canadians living safely on the side of the ocean. Although some might say that this is a political decision based on the 2015 elections, I firmly believe Canada is stating their position and will continue to work closely alongside their allies for Ukraine's sovereignty. Who's the author? Jay Wade, fourteen-year veteran Canadian Forces with deployments. Is this, is this like Afghanistan and Haiti? This real? It's like local news, or is he an actual reporter? Oh, like uh, he's a reporter for Safra. Oh, what's what's Safra? Uh, there are special forces like media conglomerate. They have their own radio show. They've got guys writing books. Uh, this is cool because it's a guy from America's Hat from Canada. You know, hmm. uh, who actually knows the fuck he's talking about. Um, saving numerous lives, often under fires, tactical combat, casualty care, wounded in action in Afghanistan. He is now studying international relations at Laval <laughs> University in Quebec, Canada. And his primary language is in French. So what an outstanding writing. I think I'm going to go uh, to Canada one day. Why? Just goes, be fun, right? Road trip. I mean, I, I'd definitely like to see it. I've always heard things about it. There's never been any aura about it with me though, because living out in Ohio is like essentially living in Canada. So, Canada, pretty much it's Canada. I mean, like half the population is Canadian. So. Were there a lot of moose over there? <laughs> no, they're actually what the fuck's this shit? <laughs> No, there's actually no moose. I wish there's freaking moose. That'd be epic. Oh, schnapps. Here we go from a trusted news source. You know, I swear, if you want to know the news, you fucking report on it. Obama not ruling out U.S. military action in Congress. But if, if you could see... If you can see his finger. It's crooked. It's pointing. He almost has a command hand, but he's not military since looks, he's just a pussy. It looks like he's trying to chew somebody out. The command hand is being pointed, but instead of using it, he's using his index finger. From far away, you don't know if he's saying, no bombs over there, or if he's just pointing his, hey, you fucked hard, you know. Following years of continued fighting and disorder in the troubled reason, President Barack Obama revealed today that he has not ruled out taking immediate and decisive military action in the United States Congress, admitting that diplomatic out outreach efforts in the area have so far proven unsuccessful. The president claimed that 
his administration is weighing the feasibility of committing combat troops to both the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives in order to bring lasting peace and stability to the chaos afflicted legislature. We have not yet made a decision as to how we are going to address this rapidly deteriorating situation, but as point, I can tell you the military action is indeed on the table. Obama told reporters at the morning president morning press conference, emph emphasizing that he has he is deeply troubled by the escalating hostilities and diminishing prospects for unity on the congressional floor. Clearly, sending our young men and women in the tumultuous war zone is not ideal, and I will hope that to resolve the situation through peaceful means. But as conflict continues to worsen, it becomes increasingly evident that the deployment of our armed forces may be our only real option. Hmm. Good choices. Man, that Obama guy. It, you, and you see, you see there's the Congress right there, right? And you've got these streets, the roads, Dude. and then continuing peacekeeping efforts in Senate region with air support, engage House chamber and heavy firefighting to root out extremists in region, weaken central Bretons defenses with air and ground campaign. This guy's fucking serious. Congress is fucking... They're gone. They're surrounded. As conditions worsen by the day, President Obama confirmed to reporters that he is... that he and his military advisors are currently evaluating the merits of military option, <laughs> suggesting that his administration has left open the possibility of toppling the hostile, unpredictable leadership currently reigning over the Legislative Assembly and restoring order to the Capitol building. <laughs> I'm not going to read the rest of this. That's uh, from the America's finest news source. The Onion. The Onion. <sighs> Striking again. Just when you think that you know what's going on... You don't know. You don't know. And I haven't actually read this source at all. Uh, I haven't read this article. But uh, according to reason... Uh, Read that? Making Muslim terrorists. The term identity politics is basically used less as a designation rather, I mean, than as a sneer. Disapproving shorthand for the balkanized multiculturalism. Aaron Kandani's new book, The Muslims Are Coming, Coming sees the subject through a different lens. For Kundani, a, an adjacent professor of media culture and community communication at New York University. Identity politics isn't something to, the, to, to get goodies from the government. It's something the government does to justify and expand the power of the national security state. This isn't necessarily a new argument. Its roots go back to the least to, uh, to full cult, and it has been elaborated in numerous venuses or venues. Melissa Gira, Grant's forthcoming book, Playing the Whore, for example, talks about the way the prostitute as an identity was created by the state as a way to codify, regulate, and criminalize a range of acts. But Kunda, Kun, Kundani's account of creation of category Muslim is riveting, thanks to its ideal and its relevance. Before 9-11, as many a Muslim commentator po has pointed out, Arab and other Muslim immigrants in the U.S. were well on their way to whiteness. They're even being courted ostentatiously by the Republican Party. When the planes flew into the towers, all of a sudden they were not white all at all, but Muslim. A despised and marginalized minority. The word Muslim has existed for centuries, of course, but now it took a new connotation. Rather than a relatively innocuous religious marker of little interest to the authorities, the identity mu Muslim has a threat and a profile something to be regulated, police feared, and controlled. It wasn't just the events of 9-11 that created a marginalized Muslim identity. The U.S. and the U.K. both did a great deal of ideological and logistical work to create something that Kunani's phrase could be the, an object of police inquiry. Conservatives' contribute, co contribution was to create the now familiar fantasy of a war of cultures. In this narrative, Muslim 
was not a complicated multinational centuries-long tradition compromised of millions of different individuals. It is a single, nonolithic, repressive glob tainted irredeemably everything it touched. Muslim became one identity, and the identity was evil. That's pretty harsh. On the surface, liberals presented a more nuanced view. Rather than seeing Islam as an innately evil, they have argued, and governments have argued, that, they are, that there is a good moderate Islam, and that radicalized extremists are perverted this medial, me, damn it. Moderate core? Yeah, that. The goal then becomes to shore up the good Muslim identity by identifying vectors of radicalization. In view, or in this view, Muslims as a group are not evil, just weak, vulnerable, and in danger of sliding into corruption. They are potential terrorists. The goal of liberal state is to prevent them from actualizing. In practice, this has meant the Muslims are systematically and enthusiastically profiled, their communities swamped with informers, and their communications monitored. Social services have been integra in integrated with police so that youth counselors, teachers, imams become informants, pointing out adolescents and even kindergartners who need saving watching so that they can be mentored and their data entered into the surveillance network. Kundnani Kund Nani doesn't have exact figures, but he estimates that the various police, FBI, security staff devoted to America's Muslim communities is roughly equivalent to the ratio of police to population in Eastern European nations. Not surprisingly, the aura of fear and repression, the sense of being constantly watched, the knowledge that some of your friends are spies, is similar to the accounts of life behind the Iron Curtain. The narrative of evil or weak Muslims does not prevent terrorist activity. It creates it, often literally. Based on the idea that all Muslims are potential terrorists, the FBI has taken to its using agents, provocateurs, to foment plots. If the FBI provides logistical support, weapons, and know-how, and then pays impoverished and often mentally ill large sums of money, it can convince Muslims to commit terrorist acts? <laughs> the answer, unsurprisingly, is yes. Barack Ahmed, for example, was convicted or convinced in 2010 to participate in an FBI conceived plan to try to bomb the DC metro. His arrest actually participates in an FBI conceived plan to try to bomb the DC. His arrest actually increases the danger of terrorism. Broadcasting is that the FBI's plan raised the possibility of a copycat, copycat plot, and while the FBI spends its time manufacturing terror, plots, it has little time to follow through on real threats, even though the agents, provocateurs, sting give, in Kunani's words, the superficial appearance of an efficient counter-terrorism program. <laughs> the police state manufacture of Muslim identity can promote terrorism in other, less direct ways as well. Kunani's points that the American Imam Anwar al Awaiki had for years been decisively opposed to terrorist violence against civilians. The U.S. government had even reached out to him on occasion as a moderate voice. In 2002, he gave a sermon at Capitol Hill, but as part of its post-9-11 targeting of Muslims, the FBI began a series of raids on educational and charitable Islamic organizations in Virginia, where Al-Walaki Al Al lived. This convinced him that Muslims were, are, were not treated like American citizens and it eventually led him to relocate to Yemen, where his arrest and, according to his own account, tortured with the knowledge of the American government. It was only after these experiences that he began to preach the violence against America. So legitimate. I almost stopped there, but, uh... It, it kind of goes on it's a bit much still, but, uh... If you don't know, Anwar al Laki was killed in Yemen by a United States drone. Anwar al laki was an American citizen. He was not convicted in any court of any crime. And Obama had a kill list and decided to kill him. So, 
so I think, you know, this article kind of, you know, is kind of throwing out, you know, the whole concept of, you know, making a specific people group entirely terrorists, which cannot be true. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just can't say that, you know, an entire group of people is just, you know, bad. Or yeah. 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 <laughs> so I watched a, uh, a YouTube video called Buying Drugs and Guns on the Deep Web. <laughs> Every now and then I try to watch opposing views as much as I possibly can. And uh, this video was trying to portray that Tor and Silk Road and the other obfuscated parts of the internet as something... They try to satirize and extremize the use of the internet to purchase whatever you want. So, and they go along with, you know, Tor is used to obfuscate and to hide yourself and to do, you know, whatever you want to do on the internet, which may or may not be true. And then utilizing Silk Road, where they had talked about how people will put on to Silk Road um, places where you can purchase guns and stuff like this. This guy is from, he spoke German, I can only assume that he's from Britain, I think. His, he has so many accents going on, I can't really tell where he's from. This is actually from Vice, and Vice actually put this out, which I thought was very interesting from their point of view, because it was a very targeted viewpoint where it's like, oh, guns are bad, and the deep web is bad, and it's all used for raping girls, and and uh, making guns and things like that, so... They had show this guy, you know, he supposedly was, like, taking inert guns and then converting them to be used for violence. And, mm-hmm. you know, God forbid you go on this, this you know, the, the Silk Road. Uh, so this is really cool. Some vo- voluntarist guy, I don't know what his actual name is, but he's a voluntarist that came onto the, onto the comments on that video. That was freaking awesome. If you don't like language, go fuck yourself. So, this is his direct quote. Fuck this asshole. Selling an inanimate object, whether that be a gun or made of metal or plastic, whatever drug you choose to inject, into your eyeballs. No one has the right to tell you that you cannot justly acquire property as long as you are not harming or defrauding anyone. People like this who want to control what people do with their lives and what they choose to purchase or consume are the reason our world is so fucked up in the first place. Just leave the people the fuck alone. Voluntarist guy. <laughs> I thought the other this this one was great. I love this comment. As an American, I find this reaction to firearms kind of funny. The way he thinks some modified piece of shit gun is such a huge danger. If it's close enough, it can kill someone. Laugh my fucking ass off. I think it's hilarious that while they're going through all the trouble to get what is essentially a beefed up pellet gun, I can go to Bass Pro shops up the street and get an AR-15 with no permit needed. This kid's name's Kavon McKee. And or uh, the next guy goes, step one, buy guns. Step two, kill child molester. <laughs> so if you're following the logic of, of what Vice put out, you know, if, oh god forbid, you're in Germany, you're gonna use Silk Road to buy guns and, you know, fuck little girls. Well, what if you do what Kevin McKee says? Step one, buy the guns. And step two, go after the child molesters and kill them. Did you know speed up slow moving drains? What? What? Some random YouTube thing that comes up. I, I, it was the, my pop-up thing for the, oh. the YouTubes. I, I don't know. Ukrainians outside White House to spill blood of President Obama. Invade Ukraine now! <laughs> <laughs> I 
that's kind of my title for this next, uh, this next, uh, post that the LA Times put out. It's so great. <laughs> All you have to do is just change the words, you know, any U.S. steps to punish Russia unlikely to alter course in Ukraine. And just, you know, change it to, Ukraine's outside White House to spill blood of President Obama. Invade Ukraine now! Mm -hmm. Obama did not trust Putin. It's <laughs> good advice. Have to do that. By Paul Richter. Washington, President Obama has a variety of ways he can make good on his threat to make Russia pay costs for his military intervention in Ukraine. But it's not clear it, any of them will make any will make a difference in Russian President Vladimir Putin or whether they may they might simply underscore the United States relatively weak hand in the unfolding Ukraine crisis. The US and its European allies can take steps to isolate Russia dip diplomatically which would undermine Putin's claim that his country is again as ascended as a world leader. They can also take steps that would pinch the Russian elite which relishes its access to Western Europe. Some of the moves would sting, but none is likely to not likely to greatly change the behavior of Putin, experts say. Putin is prepared for this kind of international backlash, said your Eugene rumor of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who was the US national intelligence officer for Russia until December. In his mind this won't be this won't be paying too much of a price. Obama sought to step up the pressure Saturday, telling Putin in a nine-minute phone call that he would cancel the U.S. participation in a June meeting of the Group of Eight, leading international nation, industrial nations in so Sochi, Russia, unless Moscow step, stop what he called its breach of international law. Wait, so Obama called him for like 90 minutes? What did he talk about? Yo, dude, how's it going? I hear you've been doing some things I don't like. I saw a picture today of Obama <laughs> riding on the back of a horse <laughs> holding <Yeah>. Putin. Aw, <laughs> that's, that's really cute. This is so fucking great. <laughs> I have to show it to like, you. Like, like a mini side of Putin? <laughs> so Cause, good. Cause that's so really funny. Oh, hopefully it's on this. Oh, God. I don't, I don't know if it is, is or it? not. No, this is, a, this is something from the Duffel blog. Budget cuts to bring military spending down to pre-Civil War area. <laughs> I don't know who this is riding a fucking horse. But <laughs> so good. God, I don't know where... Putin! Uh, I don't know where the fuck it is. I I swore I had... Uh... <laughs> oh, God. Here's another good photo I found. <laughs> Why I serve nude. The first totally naked Marine shares his thoughts on fighting in Afghanistan. <laughs> this is from the onion. <laughs> it's so good. I don't know where the fuck it is. It must be on my on my laptop, but uh But no, it's it's a good question. You know, so if the president makes however much money a year. 90 minutes of his time is a lot of fucking money for the taxpayers. You know, if he's making, you know, 500 to a million dollars. Coal too. <laughs> I mean, you think he has, like, a direct line to Putin? <laughs> like, whatever the fuck he wants? Just puts his head up his ass. Hey there, buddy. <laughs> Putin! <laughs> but you know what? The whole, what? What nobody really is mentioning, which, you know, I haven't gone on antiwar.com. But what they would say is, no one's actually putting out, why not just do what Jean-Luc Picard would do? What the fucks give? Just don't give a shit about it. Just, Putin wants to invade? Let him invade, who gives a shit? I mean, how important is it really to American citizens that we involve ourselves in the affairs of Russia and Ukraine. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I have, like, a friend, a, a, a lady friend I had met years ago who lives in Ukraine, but 
the fucks I give about that place. I really don't care. Mm. I mean, I care about that person, you know, and if they want to come back to America, cool, whatever, but who gives a shit? I mean, like, why should America involve themselves? In, in all these things, you don't hear just one statement. Obama calls Putin for five seconds, says, do whatever the fuck you want. We don't care. We won't involve yourselves in the entangling alliances of your country. Because it's an entangling alliance. Mm-hmm. What fucks give? What? I don't know. They're just being silly right now. Although, I, I think, I think there's a reason for this. I think, I think there's a reason. So, aha, here we are. I think there's a reason why this is the news. Now, whenever you hear a big story, look for other stuff nobody else is talking about. So, U.S.-born killer shoots guard is slain in Israeli prison. So this is according to L.A. Times. Take it for what it is. Israeli guards take position Sunday at the entrance to the Rimonim High Security Prison near Tel Aviv after U.S.-born prisoner Samuel Shabian reportedly opened fire on guards and was later slain by a SWAT team. According to Jack Guez, February the 23rd, 2014, Jerusalem, a U.S.-born inmate in the Israeli prison, shot and wounded three guards Sunday before being killed by SWAT team that was responded to the attack. Israeli media identify the shooter as Samuel Shebian, convicted of killing 19-year-old Alfredo Enrique Talio Jr. in Maryland, United States, in September 1997. Shebian was 17 at the time of the killing. Remember that. According to media reports, Shebian made a bathroom stop while being transferred from cell to another in Ramian Prison in Central Israel. Maximum Security Jail. He reportedly pulled out a handgun and shot three prison guards escorting him, seriously wounded, wounding one of them. A SWAT team was called to the site to negotiate with the shooter, who was holed up in the bathroom with no hostages but still armed. An hour into the standoff, he fired at special forces, taking up positions around the cell, according to the reports. Shibian was mortally wounded when they fired back and died despite medical attention. <clears throat> Prison authorities will investigate the incident, including how the inmate got the weapon. One senior official, Eli Gosbion, told media the handgun the prisoner fired was not grabbed from one of the guards. Considered highly dangerous, Shibian was denied furloughs from prison until the Supreme, until the Supreme Court ruled on his petition a year ago and instructed the prison service to allow leaves. I don't know what that means, but probably like conjugal visits or allowing him to, I don't know, do something. During a recent weekend, oh, during a recent weekend outside the prison, Israeli, uh, Israeli media reported Shavian was caught by police after trying to steal a handgun from an Israeli citizen who was selling one. Shavian fled the U.S., United States, because he was a United States citizen, after the 1997 slaying, he left, you know, U.S. to Israel, where he was eligible for nationality due to his father's Israeli citizenship. Israel fought high-level pressure from American authorities, including from the State Department, to extradite Shemian. He was ultimately tried and convicted for the murder in Israel and sentenced to 24 years in prison. His alleged accomplice, classmate Aaron Edel, hanged himself in 98 while in police custody shortly before his trial was set to begin. How old was he when he killed that guy? 17 or some shit? Yeah. I don't understand anything in this fucking news article. <laughs> it's just... Why? Why did he go to Israel? <laughs> so supposedly he fled, right? So he kills someone, oh, this person, Alfredo. I mean, his dad was born from there, so did he think he's going to get away with the crime? By going to another country? 
I'm just confused about. I, I'm confused about how. Why did he get leave? He was convicted for murder. No, no, no. What I'm confused about is how he was tried in a prison in another country. None of this makes, makes any sense. It says here he went, he went out of prison. Basically, he has leave. He tried to get so away. he's allowed to go to and from, almost like our probationary system. But you're still, he, their probationary system might mean that he lives in the prison, but he he can go back and forth. That's As true. opposed to our probationary system, where we have so many people in prison that they have to live on their own and then go back and forth to the probation officer. Which is a little bit different, but it's the same type of system. Okay. What confuses me is about how in the hell he was allowed to be tried and convicted in another prison. Even if this even if they fought the, the, the State Department to extradite him, obviously because they felt that he was more of a citizen of their country because his father was from that country or whatever. I'm confused about how is it even possible that he wasn't taken back to the United States, tried, did seven years as a minor, and then let go to live his life monitored for the next seven years or whatever, but at least live freely as an American citizen, even though he fucked up, who knows the situation behind the actual murder, but I don't see how he could be tried and convicted in another country. Okay, okay, okay. So why do you think this is on the news? I don't know. Didn't you say you you said you think I'm you confused know? about why this isn't talked about. Oh. That an American citizen was killed under some crazy weird fucking shit. That is pretty weird shit. I mean it's just fucking weird. Like I mean it's not really a conspiracy, but it actually happened. <laughs> That's what No, it's, it's And then like his accomplice supposedly fucking like hanged himself? In police custody? That's not a conspiracy. I don't know what it is. It's got the whole hanging thing. With the, you know, uh, see, nine, you've seen, like, The Wire. Yeah, if you've seen The Wire, you know, the, the one wire thing. Uh, the guy gets pissed off at his brother and then has his brother try to be killed. And so, like, the one guy, like, strangles him. Then he, like, he kills him, you know, and then he hangs him up on the, on the door to make it seem like he hanged himself, but obviously he couldn't hang himself. Hmm. <laughs> it sounds like some shit from the wire. It doesn't sound real. It's like the most craziest shit possible. Uh, it's not a conspiracy if it's actually true, so... Syrian troops reportedly kill more than 150 Al-Qaeda-linked rebels. Beirut, more than 150 Syrian rebel fighters were killed Wednesday in an ambush by government forces outside Damascus, according to official and opposition accounts. The casualty toll appeared to be one of the largest in a single operation reported during much of the almost three-year war. The operation was said of a military push to deny rebels proximity to Damascus President Bashir Assad's seat of power. Though initially appearing in state media, accounts of Wednesday's attack and high death toll were later reported by the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a Britain-based opposition monitored organization. The group put the death toll at 152 fighters, mostly members of Islamic battalions, and al-Nusra Front and al-Qaeda-linked rebel faction. The observatory said the ambush was carried out by the combined forces of Syrian army called Hezbollah and Lebanese group that has dispatched militiamen to Syria to fight alongside government troops. The official Syrian news media said the ambush resulted in deaths of more than 175 terrorists. The government's term for armed rebels. Scores of rebels were injured, they reported. The dead include fighters from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Russian Republic of Chechnya. The state news service said, thousands of Islamist fighters from across the globe have traveled to Syria to join the rebel movement, according to Western intelligence officials. Wow. That's that's pretty wild, right? Like, Well, Hezbollah... No, 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 no. I'm saying the way that, 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 that 
that organization works. Like when something happens in one place, people from around the world go to that one place to do things. Essentially, they're fighting a religious jihad to free the oppressed. You you would have to really watch, like Vice news. I've watched like seven or eight different documentaries from Vice. And they kind of go through the different groups and the different factions, the different yeah. people that are fighting. <sighs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, it, it takes a lot of commitment to do that, to spend money on a flight and take the big-ass risk of getting caught on the flight. This is why America shouldn't be involved. And later on in this, we don't have to read through the whole thing, but I mean, that's... later on, basically, it mentions, too, that, you know, probably uses the phrase U.S. forces or something, but... Special Forces is there doing stuff. Yeah. You know, if you hear Hezbollah anywhere, I would assume also that either America's funding them or has funded them in the past and may or may not be doing things. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, there is no good side or bad side. You know, I don't really know why America would be in Syria, to be honest. I don't see America freeing any of the oppressed if the oppressed are the freers and the freers are the ones oppressing. Like... <laughs> There's no good or bad side. It's just a civil war of a bunch of people who don't agree on shit, you know? No, yes. No. Yes. No. Yeah, I mean, that's yes. essentially what it is. Yes. No. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, there's no good <laughs> side, you know? It's like, it's just a magazine full of AK-47 fucking bullets that one's good, one's bad, one's fucking black, one, one's brown, you know, the other one's green. Don't ever shoot the green ones, because it might blow up, you know, like. <laughs> Still, though, I mean, that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of thought to, to do that. Well, you know, what is interesting, too, is, because, you know, I mean, you read the Bible, so that the, the, the Philistines then went against the Israelis, and, you know, how American Christians view that, those are the people of God, so we're supposed to support them. So if you don't support the Israelis who started Hezbollah, who are then going doing things. <laughs> it's like this whole, like, circle, circular... And two, these people are fighting a religious war to free people. Whether or not they're on the good side or bad side of... Uh, they all got dead, though. You see that? They basically bought a plane ticket to their own death. For good or bad? No. I don't know. We'll you will, we'll see another ten years. We'll see who wins. You know that's the way it works, right? It's fucking insanity. But I mean, still, I mean, the only the only reason that I've personally ever heard somebody say, "Hey, I'll take a flight for you," is me being friends with somebody. You know what I mean? Me being really close to somebody. But this, it's like people from around the world go to one's place. It's like, none of you guys really know each other. They're doing it for. Like their beliefs or whatever. And that's really, that's crazy. it's a brotherhood it's a of, of, and I think is a is a, even if the out the outcome is wrong or the reasoning for them being there is wrong, the good part is that they're fighting for their brothers. Right. I mean, and this also goes for the Americans who didn't shoot their fellow Catholics or Christians in Germany during World War Two. So there, there's constant stories of American Christians and Catholics and uh, and whatever faiths recognizing the prayers that they're countering soldiers on the other side of them, realizing that they're both of the same faith, praying to the same God, and then realizing, why the fuck am I here? Yeah. Yeah, I don't... There's countless stories of that, which is fucking insanity. I think that's why I'm not that religious. Because that's, that's too much, you know? I don't If I don't know you, I'm not going to do something for you like that. And that's that's way too much. I thought this was interesting. It's not in the news. Maybe it's in the news, but it's just not being published. Yeah. Egyptian government resigns, paving way for CC to run for president. So, put things into perspective. Ohio National Guard deploys in 2008 to help secure, train, and assist Egyptian police forces in helping combat terrorism in Egypt. Fast forward 
six years later, the Egyptian government resigns, paying way for Sisi to run for president. Cairo, in surprise move that pays way for Army Field Marshal Abdel Fattah Sisi to run in the upcoming presidential election. Egyptian Prime Minister Hazim Balibi announced his cabinet's resignation on Monday. According to Egyptian regulations, Sisi, who is still the country's acting defense minister, has to quit his military post before he can be nominated as a civilian candidate. An Egyptian official has quoted by Reuters as saying that Sisi did not want to appear to be acting alone by solely submitting his resignation. This was done as a step that was needed ahead of Sisi's announcement that he will run for president, the official told Reuters. Bobby did not cite any motivations behind the unexpected resignation. Instead, he spoke of the immense responsibility to his cabinet as he shouldered since his appointment. The government made every every effort to get Egypt out of the narrow tunnel in terms of security, economic pressures, and political confusion, the Prime Minister said in a live televised speech. Balabi was appointed as part of the series of steps announced by Sisi, the country's de facto ruler, following the outs the ouster of ouster? I'm not sure if that's a word of former President Mohamed Morsi in popularity in popularity supported military coup last July. He acknowledged as a rising number of labor strikes in Egypt, but defended his cabinet as saying that no government in the world could have fulfilled all the demands of its people in such a short period of time. Assuming that the demands of the people is to have a government. (laughs) In most cases, the results of his cabinet's work were good, he added. State news agency MENA announced that interim president Aldi Mansour has asked Balabi to run the government until the resignation is officially accepted and new cabinet is appointed. Current housing minister Ibrahim Malib is expected to be tasked with heading the new cabinet, according to newspaper Al Abrahim. No comments by people. I find it interesting. I mean, this is essentially political science in uh, one thing. It's one news article. It's snowing outside? I don't think it's going to snow. Those damn fucking meteorologists. Always lying to the people. Ah, here we go. Drones! Gotta gotta talk about the drones. Talk about the drones! I think I broke it. Did I break it? Ah! U.S. seeks new bases for drones targeting Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. If the U.S. must withdraw all forces from Afghanistan by the end of 2014, alternative sites will be needed for drone strikes in Pakistan targets. I wish this was actually from the Onion. I wish it was actually fake. 14 years. Well, actually 20-something, if you include the times during uh, Russia was in, in Afghanistan while America was funding the Northern Alliance, and then... Fucking shit. It spans our entire... I mean, I've met a guy who was actually there in the fucking, like, 60s and shit. He was an old-ass bastard. He had spent so much fucking time in Afghanistan that he'd probably spent more time there than he actually spent in the United States. It was fucking ridiculous. A new jet-powered drone called the Avenger could figure in plans to use bases outside Afghanistan it's in a really soft and amazing voice because it could get to targets in Pakistan much faster than propeller driven Predator and Reaper drones, said Chow, Chad Satry of General Atomics, February the 16th, 2014. That's a sexy ass drone. The Obama administration is making contingency plans to use air bases in Central Asia to conduct drone missile attacks in northwest Pakistan in case the White House is forced to withdraw all forces from Afghanistan at the end of the year, 
according to U.S. officials. You know, it would make me even more, like, happy and warm inside, you know, if there was, like, an annotation, like, right under it, like, with a good question mark, like, use Marines stationed at White House to take Comrade Obama into custody for crimes against the United States, for going outside of the confines of being the president. There's a reason why Marines are stationed there, and they should be doing their jobs, which is... But, even if the alternative bases are secured, the officials said the CIA's capability to gather sufficient intelligence to find Al-Qaeda operatives and quickly launch drone missiles at specific targets in Pakistan mountains travel region will be greatly diminished as the spy agency loses its drone bases in Afghanistan. CIA is targeting a killing program, thus must prove a casualty to the bitter standoff for the Afghan president, on the Karzai, over whether U.S. troops can remain in Afghanistan after 2000. 14, as the White House has sought. Karzai has refused to sign the bilateral security agreement to permit long-term American deployment, and some White House aides are arguing for a complete pullout. Yeah, you know, the aides are calling for it. Because that Nobel Peace Prize winner, that guy... Yeah, he did win the Nobel Peace Prize. Fucking asshole. According to a current former officer, CIA anal- analyst... Operating analysts. (laughs) They do be (laughs) anals. Operating from fortified outposts near the Pakistani border. Evaluate electronic intelligence. Oh, I didn't know. They're not allowed to say the name of that place that's by the place that's in the thing. Okay. Where? I can't say because I know the place that's near the place that's near the thing in Pakistan. Oh, that thing? That's the place that the people work at that do the stuff. Well, a case... It's in that place, right? Yeah, it's in the place they do the things and they talk about the stuff. Is this a news article? <laughs> well, no, they can't actually say the name of the place that's in the Pakistan border. That's by the place that's in the thing. <laughs> While case officers meet sources who help them identify targets, they pay people to place GPS trackers on cars or buildings to help guide the drone launch... Wait. While case officers meet sources to help them identify targets, they pay people to place GPS trackers on cars or buildings to help guide the drone-launched missiles. They can say that? They did, just now. Huh. Who knew? I guess it's not classified anymore if you know about it. There is an enormous amount of human intelligence collected that supports the strikes, and those bases are a key part of it, one official said. The CIA cannot fly drones from its Afghan base... Bases without U.S. military protection, according to several American officials, who spoke on a condition to anonymity because the program is classified. If the bases are evacuated, the CIA fleet of armed Predator and Reaper drones can be moved to airfields in North Pac- Afghanistan, U.S. officials say, without naming... The co- Wait, what? If the bases are evacuated, the CIA fleet of armed Predator and Reaper drones could be moved to airfields north of Afghanistan, U.S. officials say... Without naming the countries? But it's so fucking stupid. There are contingency plans for alternatives in the North, said one official briefed on the matter. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, Hagel, Gaggler, probably gag, gaggles, uh, gaggles, gag, goggles, publicly acknowledged for the first time this month the U.S. officials are examining different basing options for. What? Oh, I don't even, oh, this is fucking ridiculous. I just... Oh. Even at the end of it, let's see if this guy even questions it. They don't think as a reprise CIA of the program be more transparent took over, Vince Fisher said. Tell the official book, back a plan that General Joe Dumford, the top commander in Afghanistan for keeping about 10,000 U.S. troops in the country of 2014, if only to keep the CIA drone pan going... It's one of the reasons the intelligence community is supporting General Dumford's plan, one official said. Obama has not yet approved a deployment plan, in part, because of the standoff with Karzai. We the people. Obama. We the people. Obama. Democratically elected government that's a republic for the people, by the people. Yeah. 
Not one mention. Not one fucking mention in the whole entire article about maybe it's not a good plan. No, it's a good plan. Maybe Congress should actually vote on a fucking war to sending American troops places. Obama does not have that power, according to the Constitution, which he's supposedly a democratically elected leader of the free fucking world. God damn it. I swear. Just, you never know. Oh, we know. Well. Oh, dude. This is amazing. So we were looking up a base by my friend's house, right? We're trying to find jobs, okay? Oh, this is fucking great. <laughs> Read this. George A. Philo III. Major George A. Philo III was an Air Force intelligence officer who not only had an extraordinary encounter with a massive UFO on radar over the United Kingdom, but later, in the 1970s, while he was at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, found out that an extraterrestrial biological entity had been shot <laughs> at Fort Dix. The extraterrestrial <laughs> fled to adjacent McGuire Air Force Base where it died on the tarmac. He testifies that this life form was then picked up and ten and taken to the Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Afterwards, many of the key personnel on base who had a connection with the event were quickly transfigured transferred. Major Filler also points out that uh, the ridicule factor has been very effective in size of people who have seen ETs or UFOs and has helped to maintain secrecy. <laughs> GF, Major George Filler, SG, Dr. Stephen Greer. My, J, my name is George A. Filler III. I was in the Air Force. I was in U.S. Air Force and my final rank was Major. I was a navigator and in various aircraft and tanker transport aircraft. I was an intelligence officer most of my career and in that period frequently briefed gen generals and congressmen on our capabilities and threat to our forces. Well, I was a briefing officer and I would come to work at four or so in the morning. On the morning of January 18, 1978, I drove through the main gate at McGuire and noticed that there were red lights out on the runway and probably something was going on there. I don't think too much about it until I got to the 21st Air Force Command Post, which was where I worked. I was the deputy director of intelligence for the 21st Air Force, which controlled half the military craft that flew per blah, 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 blah. We had some 300 aircraft that were flying all kinds of missions. Almost anything that I didn't do, anything, blah, 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 was accomplished. This particular <laughs> morning, when I went to the command post, I was met by the head of command post, and he said that it had been a very exciting evening, that UFOs over McGuire all night and had apparently landed or possibly crashed at Fort Dix. And that when a military policeman came upon the alien and had put out a gun and shot him. And I said, foreigner, what kind of alien? Wait, what? <laughs> I was a little bit confused by him saying alien. And then he said, no, an alien from outer space. He's very specific about the fact that an alien from outer space had been shot at Fort Dix. <laughs> and that he had ran away from after being wounded and headed for McGuire. Now McGuire and Fort Dix just have a fence between them. And this alien apparently climbed the fence or went under it. <laughs> and got to a car and died on the end of the road, on, on the end of the runway. The security police were out there and had captured the body, or so to speak, and were guarding it. They said that the that a C-141 from Wright Patterson was coming in to pick up the body. That made me stand up because I didn't realize that Wright Patterson had C-141s. I thought Military <laughs> Aircraft Command was the only one who owned C-141 aircraft. So I was like, my gosh, what's going on here? Really major. <laughs> He said, we want you to brief us at the stand-up major or general briefing this morning and explain what happened to everybody. And I said, you want me to tell Major <laughs> General Tom Sadler and everybody in the command post who captured an alien? <laughs> yes, we want you to brief them this morning. <laughs> that's pretty, that's a lot of work. That sucks. <laughs> This is according to ufologywikia.com. So they were like, here, go sound like an idiot and talk about aliens in front of generals. He probably had his hands in his pocket, too. <laughs> Damn, you fuckers with your hands oh, I think I'm stupid. <laughs> oh, God. 
I had to troll everybody. I, I hate, there's, there's facts and fucking photos. So, what do you think? You think there's UFOs out there? Yes, a major saw one. I believe it. Major saw it. Hey, it's, he commanded he's it. He's he's higher ranking than me, so he was leading the way. Yes, he saw it. He led the way. He did. <laughs> with the, didn't you tell me about a report of some guy with a glow belt today, <laughs> dude? Oh my god! I get this. You, I get this text get the, message from you. you. I had to picture? read it for the second time. I was like, army guy. Glow belt running by supermarket? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Yo, I took a picture of him. Or Where's her. My... It was a girl. Where's my phone? It was. I think she's from like uh, the Coast Guard. Nash. I don't know. It was. It was gray and black. So it's the dude, I just saw a dude walking his dog wearing a glow belt in the supermarket parking lot. Ha ha ha! I think he was army. I think like ten, dude. <laughs> I hate you. I'm going to sleep. I love you, Jose. You also, I, I send you a picture of, of him. Oh, I, I I can't get photos with this. Oh uh, man, you, I gotta show you later because this dog had a little raincoat. Dude, you have to put it up on Facebook. No, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> You're silly. This has been Death Metal Chronicles. Bye, Bye. Jose. I love all the viewers. The viewers love us. We love you, and we will take you out to dinner and rub our beards on you. We love you.